a quick thing on radiometric dating. I was going to do a whole big scientifically disproving every point, but there's a lot of people that do that, and I think people just need a real basic. I mean, it's really simple why this stuff can never be accurate. It's really, really basic. Um, and that's all of them. Uh, we're up here on the old wiki page for it because we're going to see here just how many different types they got. They got all kinds of, look at this, 10 other methods. So they, they got hundreds of methods of, of uh, radiometric dating. They all have the same flaws. There's a whole bunch of assumptions that need to be made with every single different type. And they use these different types not to date the same rock to get, you know, sometimes they do, but most of the time they're using a specific type because of the type of sample that they have, whether it be a rock or um, they'll use carbon dating on like an old tree or something. Um, it depends on what the sample is composed of as to what you're going to use to actually date something, which is why you've got all these different types. But they all use the exact same equations and the exact same assumptions, with the exception of carbon dating, which is probably the most accurate method um, for simple reasons we'll get into here. Um, as you can see, rubidium, strontium, uranium, radiocarbon, fission, blah, blah, blah. The wiki page has all the different types. Um, yeah, as much as I don't like Wikipedia, it's good enough for there. So what we're going to do now is get into why radiocarbon dating or radiometric of any type can never be accurate. And we're going to look here, and I am going to use an Answers in Genesis article. Because, you know, guess what? Um, the people that do these articles are like PhDs in geology and stuff. So as you can want to say that I'm going to a creationist site and these people are idiots. Uh, all these guys down here are doctorates in uh, geology. All these references that they have. And the guy who wrote it up here, uh, what's his name? Dr. Andrew Snelling. I think I have his page here. Yeah, he's, uh, he's a PhD in geology. So, and he's been working for 40 years in geology and does creation work. So if there's anyone who's qualified to talk about this stuff, it's going to be him. And, you know, this is a reference article. I'm not going to go over his opinions about anything. He's just pointing out the assumptions that are fact. Um, I personally have talked to people that do this stuff and they say, yeah, it's dead on. Um, here is the biggest problem is the conditions at time zero. Um... This is the, the why it, none of these methods can be accurate because you've got a sample and it's decaying and you've got something that's got a little bit of a parent element and a little bit of a daughter element. We'll get my little picture up here. Um, say you've got a uh, potassium argon. So you've got up here at number one, you've got a sample that's uh, potassium and then it decays to argon. Uh, well, what you're assuming up here in number one, where this is, is that there is no argon at all, right? And then you get your half-life where half of it goes over to argon, and then another half-life where it goes even still some more and more and more and more. But up here at number one, you're assuming, regardless of what method you use, it doesn't matter what method. Carbon dating is a different animal altogether, but all of these other methods are assuming that there's nothing up here at number one where you start. That means when the rock was created or whatever, the sample, it's typically going to be a rock, but we'll just say sample. When the sample was created, there was no daughter element. Um, you go back, we'll look at what the daughter elements means. All of these different things here, the parent element is the first one listed and the daughter element is the second one listed. So you're going from the parent decaying to the daughter. That's what all of these, there'll always be two words here. Potassium, argon, rubidium, strontium, uranium, thorium. This is the parent decaying to the daughter. Um, and now I'll say that the process is, you know, the math behind it and the people that defend this stuff, they say, oh, all this stuff and the math works out and then we can calculate it perfectly. I, I agree with all that. But you're assuming that you're starting at zero, which is a huge problem. A huge problem. Um because you don't you don't know that you're starting at zero the only rocks that you can date are lava because that's the only things that you know when they were actually created and uh, they've done that and guess what lava is created and it has daughter elements already in it um, it was this mount st helens um, erupted in 89 or 82 or somewhere in the 80s and they dated that stuff and it came out anywhere from 20,000 years old lava to 3 million years old lava and it's, what, 20 years old lava? 
Uh, so their assumptions are completely wrong. And the farther from the original start point condition that you are, the more incorrect that assuming time zero is going to be because you're dealing with long periods of time. We're a little tiny bit of uh, extra daughter element or a little tiny bit extra daughter element that leeches out or whatever you're measuring. That little tiny bit could be millions of years if you're dealing with something with a half-life of a billion years. Do you see? Do you see that? And, you know, you're dealing with bones that are sitting in the dirt and, uh, you know, rocks that who knows how they were formed and how they were put together. Um, you're making all these assumptions about what the environment was like. Here's your contamination problem. And anytime anyone gets a result that they don't like, they just say it's contaminated. And, you know, you can take um, some of these methods, you can take a sample and soak it in distilled uh, water and make them look like they're millions of years old just by the distilled water leaching out all of the minerals. Uh, you know, and that would be considered a contaminated specimen. Now, the constant decay rate, um, I don't really get into that because, it, you know, I'm just going to say that the decay rates are constant. I really don't care. But you're, you're assuming that... Um, the half-lifes, we'll look at our picture here, we'll say that it takes a year for, for is the half-life. That means after one year, you go from a full sample of something, half of the, your parent element will decay to your daughter element in a year. We're using it as an example. And then, so that's like, cuts it in half right there, 50%. And then a year later, it will cut what you have left to 50%, and another year, another 50%. So... It's almost like an exponential um, reverse decay. You decay a whole bunch right away, and then it gradually tapers off, but it's still always 50%, which is why they refer to it as a half-life. It is a more or less a scientific principle and constant law type thing. Um, so the decay rates, I don't really care about, because if you're starting with a totally messed up number, you're never going to get anything right. Um, it, it's just how it is. You can go with go on about decay rates and this assumption all you want, um, whatever. It doesn't matter because up here, your conditions at time zero are assumed. It's assumed there's no daughter elements because otherwise nothing would work. It, it, isn't that just a retarded idea? And you know, every time that you know when something was created, every time this has been tested, it's proven to be false. Every single time. It's never come out right. And you know what their excuse is for that I brought up the Mount St. Helens Lava Dome? They, their excuse for that was is that, well, radiometric dating doesn't work if it's uh, um, less than 10,000 years old. Well, isn't that convenient, right? Does that make any sense at all? It works perfectly outside of 10,000 years? Um, it, it, it should work the other way, shouldn't it? Shouldn't it say that the rock is zero years old all the way up until 10,000 years old, and then all of a sudden you start getting an accurate reading? See, it doesn't make any sense. It's all a bunch of double talk, mind confusion stuff to try and babble pe bamboozle people. But here is the problem. Conditions at time zero. All this other stuff is icing on the cake. And I'll add that there's more than three assumptions. These are just the biggies. But the only one that matters is right here, right? If this is messed up, everything else can be perfect. And you're going to have wrong info. So rather than get into a whole big scientific thing, this is the problem here. This is the, the, the issue. And the only uh, radiometric method that does not have this issue is radiocarbon dating. Now, radiocarbon dating has a bunch of other issues that the other ones don't have, but it does not have the problem of conditions at time zero. Uh, and we'll get into that here. Here is the uh, article with the lava dome some creationist site anyways um here is the I, here is the ages and the samples from people who are uh testing it and i have a video on my channel that's microbiologist loses faith in evolution mount st helens and i indicated the time code in the in the results or the samples where he talks about mount st helens and this is a guy who does ge done geology projects all of his scientific life and had has been the person who has done these um, 
with the, the very same labs before he was a creationist, the very same labs he dated the Grand Canyon and every other project with, he dated Mount St. Helens and came up with, you know, hundreds of thousands of years for the lava dome, which is brand new rock, which is theoretically age zero, right? The zero age conditions. And here you can see they're coming up with half million years, 60,000 years old. And these are brand new, brand new stuff from the, the lava dome. And here's other areas of known eruptions. All these should be zero. So you should have something here that's 200 years old, 300 years old. And you got 1.6 million years. 1792, 400 years old, you got 1.4 million years, right? 1915, you got 110,000 years, 300,000 years. Huh. It, it, you know, and this problem only gets worse and worse. These numbers only get larger the farther away from the actual date because of the way um, the whole system works, because of the half-life. A little tiny error in this totally screws up the whole thing. So this is the main site. For some reason, um, people recently have been linking this crap from Talk Origins, which I've debunked before. Uh, come on, you guys, you can't debunk anybody with this crap anymore. The site is has not been updated since 2006. Okay, It's totally out of date. And everything on here is retarded, easy to debunk. So quit it. You're wasting my time with it, all right? Just just so you don't come up with this crap for me anymore. I'm going to debunk this at the same time. Here's their thing on radiocarbon dating and radiometric dating. They say that all the principles are all just perfect and all the math is perfect and everyone else is screwed up. And if a, something falls into where it shouldn't be, it's contaminated somehow and creationists are a bunch of idiots. That's what this article says. It does not say anything about the assumptions. It doesn't say anything about, well, you know... The assumption at, at zero daughter elements at the at the beginning has been proven anywhere. It just wants to talk about the math, which I'll agree is accurate. The math and the uh, the decay rates and all this stuff, it, that's what it wants to talk about. It doesn't want to talk about the assumptions you have to make because, hey, guess what? they got to make the assumptions. Um, so these anything from this site, all you atheists out there, you better read it. And you better get some up-to-date info and make sure that it is is still relevant. Now, there's a lot of stuff on here, and I don't doubt that some of it is probably still relevant. But don't link this crap to me. Don't do it. It You'll look like a fool. Because mainstream science has wiped out a lot of this stuff. I don't even need to go to any creationist arguments or anything. Um, this stuff is wrong now. Because science changes all the time, guys. You can't use 10-year-old sites to try and prove science stuff. You got to go with the new stuff. Uh, just putting that out there. So we'll move on. We're going to talk a little bit about radiocarbon dating. The reason that this one does not have the time at time zero problem is because we know what time zero is. Time zero is going to be when the animal died. Uh, carbon dating works. We'll take a living critter like a cat. Um, while the cat is alive, he is soaking up carbon-14 radioactive element that uh, the plants suck up through the atmosphere. It's a carbon form, and they uh, suck up carbon dioxide, and this radioactive C14 element is in some of that. And so the plant gets it in its structure, and then an animal eats the plant, and then it eventually gets to the cat, because the cat will eat the animal that ate the plant, if you understand how that works. Um, it all comes down to plants, and... Whatever eats the animals that eat the plants or the animals eat the plants themselves, whatever. Everything gets C14 in it. You got C14 in you. I got C14 in me. But when we die, we stop eating. So, and we stop breathing. So we don't get any more C14 in us. So we actually have a start point here. Right? So you got all this. You can do bone, wood, charcoal, linen, wool. Um, charcoal, uh, charcoal is a fun one because that one's supposed to be hundreds of millions of years old and it carbon dates, <laughs> which you shouldn't be able to do. Um, so here they talk about how it gets there. You know, the sun actually creates the radioactive element, goes to the plants, goes to the deer, and then we shoot the deer and eat it. Um, so this is actually on Oxford's, what is it? Oxford University, okay? So we'll look down here at the complications. Right down here, we've got atmospheric variations which is something that I've been saying forever 
uh, radiocarbon concentration of the atmosphere has not always been constant. They know this for a fact. So all of your radiocarbon dates are totally going to be messed up because the atmosphere changes all the time. Um, it, in fact, it has varied significantly in the past. You've got giant insects, giant mammals, giant lizards, dinosaurs that couldn't live today. You got humans that are like eight to ten feet tall. They're they've dug up before in the 1800s. I mean, you don't hear about it anymore, but huge humans, um, huge animals, dinosaurs. You got uh, dragonflies with three foot long wingspans. I would say that the atmosphere is going to be significantly different in the past. So there's your problem with radiocarbon dating. Um, I don't know how much of an effect that would have on the other dating methods, but carbon dating being that it interacts with the atmosphere as to how it works, that's going to be a huge one. Um, so yeah. And of course you got contamination down here. I mean, if you're in the soil and whatever is in the dirt and it's a permeable substance, kind of like coal or bone or something like that. You can have um, water and minerals and things like that add and remove material and add and remove carbon, which is going to be a problem. I mean, so it's not an exact science, but it is a little bit better than the other ones. I would argue that because after 50,000 years, all of the C14 should be gone from something. There isn't anything that is going to add C14 back in unless it's by an artificial means. Um, I can't think of anything where a bone is sitting in the dirt. Um, there's some there's some issues with, uh, since the nuclear age, where they're doing nuclear testing and things like that. But if a bone is, you know, 20 feet in the dirt underground, it's not going to get contamination from that. That isn't going to happen. Um, and you know when they test them, they break the bones open and use the inside of them, like, obviously, right? Okay, so... Carbon dating is a little bit more accurate, but it does also have huge problems. You at least have a start date, which completely blows out all of those other methods. So carbon dating's got something going for it. We'll move on here. Now, the Oxford people, and you're going to say, what do they know about carbon dating? Well, these are the guys, this is what they do, right? This is their lab. I'm just showing that they have a radiocarbon accelerator unit, the most accurate measures of radiocarbon you know, on the planet is by using these accelerator units. Um, so they know what they're talking about. And they'll freely admit that it's not accurate because the atmosphere is completely different. You know, it's kind of like it's, it's an additional tool to use with other types of science, other types of methods for dating things. It's just an additional resource. So moving on. Why I mentioned about C14 and... Uh, why there isn't anything that could add C14 after an animal died. It gives you a plausible start date. And you also got dinosaur bones that have been carbon dated. So people want to say that dinosaurs are 65 million years old. Well, how do you get C14 in a dinosaur after it's dead and buried in 20 to 50 feet underground? In a mud layer or a rock layer? Uh, those interested in this page, I think I have a video for C14 and dinosaur bones and have it linked. But... They got a nice little video here, and down here is where all of these different bones and the different types of dinosaurs have been carbon dated to be, you know, anywhere from 20 to 30,000 years old, and where they found them, the date, who did it, what lab did it, what by what methods they did it. So, I mean, it's not BS. You're not going to tell me that all these different things are all contaminated from all these different sites and all these different states and by all these different labs doing the testing. That's, that's just silliness. Uh, and this article talks about who's doing what. Um, I'm not familiar with this John Michael Fisher guy, so I don't know. I'm not going to get into what he says about any of this. I will go into uh, this, though, where we've got soft tissue on a uh, T-Rex, and this is by Mary Schweitzer. And you look at this article that is from 2013, November 26, and it says controversial T-Rex soft tissue finally explained because here's the problem uh, soft tissue cannot last longer than eh, 50,000 years on the very 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 longest I mean in a laboratory it, it, they don't even think that much and that's under the best of circumstances 
And uh, it says finally explained, and I read through this article, and they still don't know. So I guess they just want you to read the headline. Um, but it did say in here that uh, they thought that the tissue could only last a million years, which I think is hilarious because every article I've ever seen is said 200,000, and then they say that that is um, like 20 times longer than they could do it in a laboratory. So it's like, I don't know where they come. Here we are. Degrade in less than a million years. Whoa. You ain't got a million years, according to everything, every place else other than this article that I look. Um, but yeah. So they've got, we've got carbon dating of dinosaur bones and their soft tissue in the bones. And they're claiming contamination, I guess, for the C14. And then, will they contaminate the tissue too? No, they've, they've tested it pretty well. And, uh, it's it's actually dinosaur soft tissue. This article does say that they looks like they found DNA, which is another big deal. I mean, there's a thing that's called the uh, second law of thermodynamics, and that means that stuff is going to break apart regardless of what you do. So you can keep DNA in its ideal preserving conditions, and after 50,000 years, it's still just going to disintegrate because of second law of thermodynamics. It has nothing to do with preserving something, you know, I mean... You can take a woolly mammoth and preserve the thing in ice, and they're finding those things all over. And, you know, on the creationist side, they're 5,000 years old or something. And they're still in decayed, you know? I mean, it doesn't matter that they're in ice in perfect, th in perfect conditions for uh, freezing for 5,000 years. They're still decayed because it's a second law of thermodynamics. So they got some splaining to do, and uh, they didn't finally explain it. So we'll keep going. And you know, because of this and because of um, the soft tissue deal, people are getting fired over it because these other people that are like, really, if I break the bone open on these uh, old dinosaur bones, you'll find soft tissue. And sure enough, they got people all over the place. This guy's fired after he uh, broke a bone open and found, <laughs> and found soft tissue because apparently like all these dinosaur bones, people didn't think to break them open. And so now they're breaking them all open and finding soft tissue in like all of them. So it's not a fluke. It's like all of them. Um, yeah. And I do have a video that's pretty interesting for radiocarbon dating where this, this Enyart live Enyart guy, I think Doug Enyart or something like that. He, um, is a, runs a, does a creationist radio show, Bob Enyart does a creationist radio show. I didn't know he was a creationist. I had him in a different video. Uh, for WMAP satellites. But Bob Enyart called Jack Horner, who is Mary Schweitzer's uh, partner. Jack Horner is the guy who actually broke open the bones. And Mary Schweitzer was the one who took the credit for it. But Horner was, they're kind of a, a pair of paleontologists. And uh, Bob Enyart is going to give him 20 grand to uh, radiocarbon date his samples that he had. And he wouldn't do it because it was going to be, he knew what the answer was going to be. He knew that it would come back giving a, result of less than 50,000 years. So he refused to do it, despite getting free money. And it was a political reason. And here you go, this guy's getting fired for the same thing. So, if anything, people, do not be deceived and don't let people tell you that radioactive carbon or radio anything says anything about the age of the Earth other than prove that it is young. Because um, these ones here, uranium, lead potassium argon these are all junk because they don't know when to start even they don't know you got a stopwatch and they don't know when to hit the timer they don't know when the stopwatch started so these don't work at all and you go to radiocarbon um radio met uh, radiocarbon dating and they say that it interacts with the atmosphere and they say well the atmosphere is completely different so we don't know um, I'd argue that when something dies, there isn't going to be any more C14 in it, barring obvious circumstances, obvious contamination. Um, so there you have it for, for radiometric dating and why it can never, ever, ever be accurate. And with that, I think I've pretty much beaten this dead horse. Um, without getting into the science of the specifics and calculus and equations, it's simple. If you if you have if you don't know where you're starting, you don't know where you're going to end up, right? Right. That.